Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have the amazing performer and director, Aiden Starr. Aiden, how are you? I'm hot. You're hot. You're out like in the valley, right? No, no. I live in downtown. I never wanted to live in the valley. I'm kind of the same. I feel like you and I might be some of the only people in porn who don't live in the valley. I live in the city. I live in like West LA. And it's actually, we've had a marine layer all morning, so it's actually not that hot here. We had a marine layer, but it burnt off, and we are, like, at the time of the June gloom when we have it for a little while, and then it burns off, so it's hot as hell. Yeah. How is um, quarantine in downtown? Because you're definitely in a place where there's a lot of people and a lot of foot traffic. Yeah. um, I don't really go anywhere anymore. Um, one of my friends is in town from the East coast and he's staying in my studio, which I live like in little Tokyo area and he is staying in my studio, which is like industrial arts district. Um, and I went over to let him in and see him. But other than that, I really don't go anywhere. I go to the chiropractor every single Thursday. And other than that, I, I shoot, my like solo stuff in my studio on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Um, and I see a PA who's also a close friend of mine. Um, but I don't really see people. I'm one of those quarantiners where I've chosen to, um, socially distance, but I'm also an introvert and I also have a compromised immune system. So I spend every winter, um, doing what we're doing now anyway, because, um, if I get colds or flus, they're worse for me than other people. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, I technically have a compromised immune system now too. I guess all pregnant women do, which I didn't even realize until my doctor told me. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, I mean, quarantine as much as I can. I don't see friends really. I, I do go see my family, but we stay outside and I have gone back to shooting a couple of times, but you know, with the three, with the three day testing window and we wear masks mm-hmm. the whole time. So, but I've only done like four days of shooting now that shooting is starting to pick up again. You're not shooting, right? You're still just doing your own thing. No, I'm not shooting. I don't really feel comfortable. Um, I mean, I was going to do one shoot last week, but a girl ended up getting strep throat. And so I was like, Oh yeah, we'll reschedule it. Yeah. Um, and everybody understood, um, I also, I paid for my tests and I paid for all the performers tests because I felt like I was being extra demanding by wanting like, it, like fresh STD panels and then a fresh COVID, like a three day COVID. Mm-hmm. And I just knew from being a performer, like how much that adds up and like the larger percentage that it takes out of your, um, your money in the end. And I'm in control of my budgets because of my specific circumstance. So I just like, we canceled the shoot and maybe we're going to reschedule it. It was a girl that was under a contract to another company that I've never shot before. And, um, her booker reached out to me, um, to work with her. And I was like, well, fuck, if I never get, if I don't shoot this girl, like maybe I'm not going to get another chance. And I am very casting specific when I shoot my stuff. So I was really hot for like the specific configuration I was going to have, but we'll get it another time. I just, I, I, I'm not against shooting. I just don't know that it's for me at this moment. Um, Yeah, I just don't know it's for me at this moment. A lot of directors feel that way, and some of the bigger companies aren't accepting footage Yeah, because of the um, COVID issue. So I have just been shooting myself. I know that what I do with my body, I'm in complete consent and control of, and Mm -hmm. so I don't have to feel guilty about, like, maybe making somebody sick. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. It's, it's definitely changed. It's changed everything. I mean, I never thought that, you know, before obviously STDs have always been an issue and a worry and I'm not a performer, so, you know, never directly affected me, but obviously you being a performer and a director that, that plays into your consideration. But now that we've got this airborne kind of, you know, very misunderstood virus that Mm -hmm. kills some people and some people have no symptoms Mm -hmm. and we don't understand it. We don't understand how it works. It's, it's scary. And I definitely have to weigh, 
the financial need to shoot and also to like the desire to shoot. I just kind of miss it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm pregnant and I'm carrying a baby and I have like another person to consider besides myself. So it's been a struggle for me to decide like what the best option is. How are you feeling about going back to shooting? Do you think that you will still before we find a vaccine or do you feel like you really want to wait until this whole thing is over? So because I'm able to make money. So I have um, an evil angel catalog, Mm -hmm. which is different than other companies. Mm -hmm. Um, I think everybody who is outside of porn wants to be an evil angel director because they want to be famous. And a lot of people inside of porn want the chance at having a catalog. Um, because it's different than how other companies work where it's a buyout system. So I still make money off of my catalog because they still distribute it. When I said I wasn't going to direct there anymore, I meant just that, like I wasn't putting out new stuff, Um, but they still have my catalog and still have my distribution. So I make money from that. And also I make a lot of money from my self shot stuff on my only fans um, titsandsass.me, which is my URL because I kept losing my aidenstar.com. And then I realized that I don't know, it's not really worth anything because it's just a forwarding device anyway, that URL. So I just opted for titsandsass.me because I thought it was funny because I'm kind of a jackass. And like my porn is not just, it's not really very straightforward porn because like while I am a director and I'm like just obviously a regular person on a set, in porn and my sexuality is like an NB dominatrix, um, which is like, a, or an, an NB, like it always dominatrix is the right word. I'm a top. Um, and so that is kind of like, like, yeah, I'm hot and I have giant boobs, but I'm also super mouthy and that's what I'm known for. And so I was kind of going for that when I did the URL. So because I have these things coming in and because that, um, Oh, I think my ex-boyfriend just sent me a picture of his dick. Um, <laughs> um, because I, well, it's a full moon. I don't know what's going on with you, but like everybody I've ever fucked ever is acting like a fucking crazy maniac during this full moon. Because I have money coming in from um, these ventures, I don't have the financial need to shoot. Um, my opinion is that if people don't have the financial need to shoot, that they should make the decision that's right for themselves. One of my friends who's a performer um, I bought her a ring light for her birthday, which uh, people listening to the show, if you're a self shooter, ring light is optimal. Um, I bought her a ring light and like iPhone rig so that she could shoot herself and not have to deal with the pressure of going back to a set environment so that she could isolate if she wanted to. Um, so for me, I don't think that I'm going to shoot before a vaccine. It's possible that the vaccine that's available won't be one that works on me because I have um, a compromised immune system. I have um, an autoimmune disorder. And so if it's the vaccine that like promotes your T cells and makes you like makes your immune system run faster, I won't be eligible for it. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize there were like different kinds of vaccines that work differently for different people. Well, you said it the best earlier, Holly, it's such a misunderstood disease um, and yeah. there's no good leader. I mean, there is leadership around um, the vaccine, uh, around the disease and contagion, but there's no like solid leadership. We, as, as Americans, we're all aware of this, that there's um, that the, our response to contagion is politicized and highly debated. And we right. don't have one way that we do things. It's not like other countries where like, this is the way we don't have that. And so there are a bunch of different vaccine options. Um, it'll be a race to see which one comes out first, which one is mandated, what people feel comfortable with. And it's misunderstood. That was the best word that you could have used to describe it. It's misunderstood. So I don't know when I'm going to go back to shooting. I haven't made that decision yet. Um, I'm still, I, I'm not, forced to make that decision because I'm lucky Mm. and I worked my balls off for 20 years and I'm 40. And that is a thing that you can do when you're 40 and you work in this industry is that you have options that younger people don't have. Um, And so I haven't decided whether I'm going to come back to it or not, or what form that's going to look like. I mean, not only is my decision to not shoot um, influenced by COVID and contagion. It's also the cultural environment of pornography. Mm. Um, not great right now. 
Uh, people do not like each other. Uh, it's hard to get people to have sexy vibes when people are um, arguing Ang- or angry you know, and afraid. A lot of people are really angry and a lot of people are really afraid. Yes. And, and not just because of COVID. Right. There are a lot of other things that are going on with porn culture. Like because COVID stopped the machine, mm-hmm. we are all able to get off the machine. And that rippled not only in mainstream culture, um, in the political landscape, um, but also in the porn landscape. Um, and so there's that for me to contend with and deal with, which is kind of what everyone's doing right now, because it's so easy to do that in a remote fashion. Like you right. can Zoom panels and you can be an activist like over the internet. Right. It's interesting what you said earlier, just, well, just now basically about being like, you know, when you said I'm 40, I can do those things. I can, you know, live off of the many years that I have put into this industry. And I was thinking about that the other day because same, I've been in this industry, I'm 41. I've been in this industry for 22 years and, you know, I'm still working from home. I also have an OnlyFans um, that is saving my butt right now. Uh, I have this podcast, which has been really helpful, and other streams of revenue. Um, it sounds like you make some kind of residuals with Evil Angel, which sounds something similar to like probably what I remember when I was shooting Lisa Ann for Evil Angel. She had some kind of deal with them, which is which is correct. That is not common with most brands, and and the brands that I shoot for for Mind Geek and for Playboy, I definitely don't get residuals. It's a flat fee, and then I have no ownership over the content. I get nothing after that. But fortunately, you know, I have my own website. I've always had other streams of revenue Mm -hmm. because I have to say, if there's one thing that my mom taught me is to never trust that any one person company is client is ever going to take care of you, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so work has obviously slowed down. Like I said, I'm still working, but I'm not as busy as I was. And I was feeling guilty kind of about that the other day. I was thinking, I should be doing more. I should be working more. This feels strange that I can take naps in the middle of the day, you know? Interesting. But but then I thought to myself, you know, you've put over 20 years into this industry and you've worked your ass off for 20 years. Yeah. Isn't it okay to maybe, you know, take a break and live off of the residual income that you have coming in from these other revenue streams and go a little bit easier on yourself. So what you said just now literally echoed those thoughts that I was having like two days ago. Why is it that you think that you feel like you should be working more? Is it because you feel like you as a person don't have value if you're not working or because like you are part of an ecosystem that supports like, like we are sharks and we support like all of the other fishes like, is it like which form of responsibility or well, is it social responsibility or is it like, like emotional masochism or kind of both? Oh, it's hundred percent both. It yeah. is definitely, I've, you know, like you said, COVID has, has stopped the machine and it's forced all of us to sit down and think about like our, our, our careers and our, our role in our careers. And I have definitely, come to realize, and this is actually something I realized before, but it's been popping up more that I 100% place my value and whether or not I'm worth anything in my career. And also getting pregnant has made me think about that too, because before I had this fear of getting pregnant and having a child, because that was going to take me out of the race. And then I was going to lose, you know? Because it's all about success and it's all about like how much money you make and like how many AVN awards you've won. I've won zero, by the way, Um, and that kind of thing. So, so definitely like my personal identity is very much wrapped up in my work. And then also too, I feel that my crew depends on me for work as well. And I feel like I have people who I need to give work to that I need to, that I need to provide for. And also, yeah. And then also too, like I'm, you know, like, I don't want people to forget about me. <laughs> so this morning I was talking to my very close friend who is a mainstream director who's not, who's never worked in porn. And um, I know him because I had a short stint working crew in reality TV, like in the middle of my sex worker career in my twenties. And he was asking me about why porn people are so um, driven, even if they don't have to, to shoot, during coronavirus or what, what just like a lot of different questions about like the crux of a lot of what 
motivation comes from important. And I said, it's because we are validated by our workplace in ways that other industries are not. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Why do I think that sex workers, specifically Southern Californian porn performers and crew members are validated by their work in ways that other industries are not? Um, there is, it's, it's obvious because you just did a whole thing about like, and, and you mentioned Holly, like how many AVN awards you had, which in my opinion is like no measure whatsoever of somebody's porn success, but it is. And it's just because that's my opinion. Like, we don't live inside of a vacuum. I also have a fuck ton of AVN awards. So I, that's a position that I can say those things. Um, I don't, we, I don't know why we feel this way, but on some level we feel like we're not good unless they've told us that we were good. And maybe there's some deep, deep, dark shadow fucking land id shit where we doubt ourselves. Um, it could be like why like a lot of us have imposter syndrome and it could be where imposter syndrome comes from. Um, it could be things about how we were raised. It could be things about being female. Um, it could be things about sex work in general. It's such a deep, dark cave to start spelunking into why we derive validation from our workplace. But I think that one thing that you can say about it is that it's an undeniable fact. Mm, yeah. You hit on so many marks there that totally apply to me, I think, you know, being a woman and I think also working in sex work, you know, we're like the black sheep of the entertainment industry, right? So we have to work so much harder to prove ourselves. I mean, have you ever been on, I know you've obviously been on a mainstream set because you just said that you were, but because I've talked to other people in the adult industry as well, and we're always so flabbergasted by going on a mainstream set and seeing how many people they are there are and how like a lot of people aren't don't seem to be working that hard that there's just a lot of people standing around doing nothing mm -hmm. and how we have to do so many different things as one person you know i'm sure that that this is the same for you i mean you're a performer and a director but i'm sure that you also like you produce and you stop and, you know, I produce, I style, I do the craft services. I am the PA. I clean the come up off the floor. I do the paperwork. Like I do the finances. I do everything. I have like 5,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it always struck me when I go to a mainstream set, I'm like, what are all these people doing here? What are their jobs? They're so, it feels like they're so lazy. So has, has that ever like crossed yeah. your mind? I think that that is a really big issue for me and I've addressed it, been able to address it like when the machine stopped and getting off of the machine, like when COVID stopped the machine um, to say that I um, have six jobs. I don't have one job, you know, and we consider it to be one job. We consider director and production manager oftentimes to be the same thing. They are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's specifically because of the, um, small run nature of adult product and because of the smaller budget, we don't have the money to hire um, a bunch of different people to do a bunch of different jobs. Um, even though I think that porn now is more professional and looks better and is a better product than it was in the time when they did have that money. Um, and there are certainly way more fucking talented people doing shit. Like I remember when I first started shooting camera People were like, oh, my God, wow, you're a girl and you shoot camera. What's that like? And I was always really fucking snotty because fuck that. I was like, oh, it's really hard to press the buttons with my slippery labia. But now, like, nobody talks to me like that anymore. No one's like, oh, you're a woman and you do camera? Cool. Like, because there are so many more. And porn is so different now. And there are so many, like, really, really um, overly qualified people. Like, any of us could fucking, like, knock down mainstream store at any fucking moment for a lot of different jobs. But we choose to be in sex work because there is there is a difference between mainstream and sex work. And I think that that difference, for me, one of them anyway, is that we are more real and we are, we are more raw. Right. We're, we're like documentarian, like documentarians, and we are catching like nature in the wild. Even if you set people up to do things like a, a, the large majority of the action of porn is unscripted, you know, and that's the, fl the flavor of it that we're going for chemistry. We're going for how people would actually touch each other. And, and you're not going to get that on a mainstream set. It's very contrived. 
And for us, it's much more organic. Um, being on a mainstream set for me and seeing all the people who didn't do that many jobs, I was kind of happy for them because it must be nice to actually be paid for the work that you do. Because if I broke down the six jobs that I have and the amount that I'm paid per hour for all those six jobs, it would be below minimum wage. Thank God I work for myself. And there's like, I'm not breaking any laws by doing that. I've paid PAs way better than I've ever been paid for jobs because I'm like, well, they're cleaning up, like you said, come off the floor. Mm -hmm. Like they're biohazard like they should be compensated for this and in porn it's just not like that it's just not how we function um i i do like to be able to step back and say like well if i am making this amount of money what what should my workflow look like like you fall into porn and you fall into contracts and you know it's a momentum and speed and then it's hard to look down and it's hard to look up and it's like being on the machine um, and so being off the machine lets me kind of look at like, well, how much time should I be spending exercising and dealing with my diet instead of calling and making sure people got their tests or not? Um, or these other things that we have to do as directors that should technically be another position. So it's nice to be able to have that perspective. Yeah. You know what I noticed uh, looking at my finances over the last couple of months? Because clearly my gross income has dropped dramatically because I'm mm -hmm. not shooting but my net income appears to be doing better. And it made me realize because, you know, we're only paid or so I'm only paid a day rate, right? I'm not paid for pre-production. I'm not paid for post-production. And I didn't realize how much money I spend paying my assistant to manage the paperwork, to do the scheduling, to run the errands, to pick up the props, to pick up the wardrobe, like mm -hmm. all of these little things and add that, that really add up and aren't factored into like the measly day rate that I get. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely made me realize like, wow, I'm really getting the short end of the stick. So I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm definitely rethinking how I'm going to come back. I don't really want to come back into full swing again. I, I do want to shoot again because I, I miss it, but I'm, I'm shooting more for myself. I'm trying to finish my art book. Um, I plan on starting on a documentary about my mom. Actually, that's my big project for 2021, but it's made me realize that working the rest of my life on this hamster wheel for other people, I don't think that's the way I want to go. And I know that that very much echoes what a lot of models have been saying on set, you know, and I think a lot of, I know a lot of directors and producers have been taking it personally when models are saying, oh, I'm making enough money on my OnlyFans. I don't want to come back to shooting mainstream studio porn. Why do you think they take it so personally? I'm so curious about this because I don't, but I also am a model. And so for me, it's like, it's different. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's because it's the idea that you are no longer needed, that your, your place is no longer valid, that uh, p models can produce their own content and they don't need producers and they don't need directors. And so it's a fear thing for sure. And, and I have definitely felt a twinge of that when I've heard those things being said, but I also like, even though I'm not a model, I'm very pro model and I've always advocated for performers and um, you know, that they would have more power and make more money because you guys are the ones that are really putting yourselves out there in the long run. Let's be honest. And do you not think that you are one of the content producers that will end up probably getting paid better and being treated better by models than by bigger companies? Because that has started to happen where yeah, I'm not finding people who shoot and we're like, right. Oh, I want you to shoot my stuff. And then you're working for a model who gets fucked in the ass who like some of them are shitty, but the majority of them are like much nicer people mm -hmm. and have a lot more sympathy for like personal struggle. And so they're nicer and more generous and believe in things like wealth redistribution. And they're not like capitalists in the same crony fashion that people who own larger companies are. It's different. So I have not experienced that really yet where models have hired me. I've had a couple of them inquire when I tell them how much money it is. They, I haven't heard from them again. So, um, so no, I haven't really experienced that. I've had a couple of models hire me here and there, um, but it's never been something that's been steady. And, and you know, honestly, I, I will say that MindGeek, like, well, Twisty specifically, who's really the only company that I shoot for under that umbrella, has had this major shift in the last 
couple of years where they treat me completely differently than they used to. And they're actually really, really good to me now. And, um, I actually enjoy working for them now. Do you think that that happened when Twisties was acquired by MindGeek? Oh, no, 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 definitely not. Uh, they, I, 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 I swear to God, I think they had some like leadership community building seminar or something like that. Some kind of internal structural change, which made them decide to start doing things differently. It's I don't know what it was. The detail of the corporate structure of pornography because I think so many fans are interested in the interworkings and really it's not that much more fucking interesting than like any other industry in their corporate um, structure. Porn is like, porn is driving around in the valley, dropping off checks, fucking picking up fucking shoes and getting people tests. Like the actual sexy part of porn is like such a small amount of what directors and producers do when it comes to our jobs. And a lot of what we do is have these conversations about corporate structure and corporate struggle and it fucking sucks because I just like to be nice to people while they're getting double penetrated. Yeah. And that's my thing is that I'm like, where would it be better if your knee was like, what piece of furniture would be better for you to be double penetrated on? Okay, great. Let's move over here. Like, that's my thing is that I'm just trying to like connect with people on a visceral level, but that's not porn. And that's certainly not Southern Californian porn. And a lot of what you're talking about is like, knowing corporate structure, knowing how things work that way and being able to respond to them in that fashion, um, which is completely different than being a porn director. I like the current incarnation of MindGeek. They reached out to me after I stopped uh, directing for um, Evil Angel and production managing for Kink. And I basically told them, like, I don't want to make any porn right now because there is a contagion. But they brought up the fact that I'm popular with performers and that performers seem to like me and that that is valuable to them, that that was like a thing that they found to be valuable, that I have good boundaries, um, that my sets are safe environments and good, like conducive for expression and that my product does well and it sells well and that I'm able to meet deadlines and that, you know, I've never like turned in footage with shitty tests, stuff like that, that like would, would knock you out of the running for being a director with a bigger contract. But, um, they seem nice and they seem like they really address issues at their company. Like one of the things was that, um, there's verification stuff with Pornhub that they yeah talking about and they, they, we're ready that I would ask them about that and had like, we're actively addressing those issues. And yeah. it's, I called them the other day. I did a, um, a lecture series. Lance Hart does this lecture series about being a pornographer and becoming a pornographer for aspiring pornographers. And I talked about that. I consider browsers to be Brett Mindy to be in the progressive production camp. And you're right. They, whatever, whatever's going on there, it's not by accident. Mm-hmm. They have, become progressives. They have like, they have tried to, they've actively made the move from porn as pornography to porn as sex culture. Mm. And they see that there's the distinction between those things and that we are moving forward in vast, vast ways very quickly because the machine stopped. And I think that they started before COVID, but they definitely ramped it up. Yeah. I'm not surprised at all that they reached out to you because I can tell you that they've been very concerned with the abuse allegations that have come out as of late. And, you know, the issue with a lot of these directors taking advantage of models and that has been a huge concern for them. And there's been some people I believe that will no longer be working with them because of concerns of onset culture and behavior. And they are being very careful about who they have working for them now. And so they have absolutely been going around to agents, going around to models, asking them about their experiences with different directors, you know, under full confidentiality. And they they really want to have a a cast of directors that are, are sex positive, that are that performers feel safe with and that, um, you know, they don't need to be concerned about boundary violations, anything like that, because I mean, they're Montreal. They can't, they can't control the sets. And, and really I'm, I know Lena Paul has done some, some wonderful movies for them, 
But ultimately, I think I'm like their only kind of consistent female director. So I'm not surprised at all that they're reaching out to someone like you because they need more women for sure. I don't know that my track record of dealing with women in positions of power and porn makes them like as a standard more ethical. Hmm. I don't, like, that's not actually my experience. Like, I think my experience with men wanting to take advantage of me and women wanting to take advantage of me is the same, but men do it in a physical, like a somatic fashion and women do it in a psychological fashion. Mm, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's definitely... But not everybody. Yeah, but it's it, there's definitely not... It's not limited to men, abuse of power. Let's let's put it that way for sure. But I do think that it would be nice to have a little bit more gender mixing in terms of their directing staff. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And I also like, I think that, so when I first started at Evil, many people postulated that I could never make a successful evil angel porn because it's such for the male gaze. And it is. We don't fucking even try to pretend. Mm -hmm. Um and I disagreed. I was like, I can make porn for the male gaze because my gaze is similar to a male gaze. And I also can look at the algorithm and put my own spin on how things work. And then I did do that. And I, everybody had to shut the fuck up about that. I couldn't make porn as well as a man because that was just proven by the numbers of working there that I am like successful there. Um, but I think that a lot of companies feel like, well, if you want to sell a product to a guy, if you have a guy making it, it's going to come like, it's going to be more um, interesting to a man than a woman making it, which obviously is not the case. Now I'm, I'm an envy, which is non-binary. Um, I am mostly female and I look female and I present as female, but my, gender orientation is in the middle. Um, I don't think that anybody listening to this or watching this is surprised because the entire internet is full of me wearing a strap on and like fucking people with a strap on and people say things to me like, Oh, you fuck just like a guy. And I'm like, well, what you're looking at there is a non-binary person. And really I am closer to a guy when I fuck in that fashion, when I wear a prosthetic. So there is something to be said for that. But I do think that like casting dispersions on somebody's gender and saying you can't make porn that's valid for the male audience is, is just disproven. Mm -hmm. And any, yeah. any idea that like you can't have a female director make porn that's just as hot and just as nasty as a male director is disproven. Not just me, like Bella Donna, who is like the really famous female director from Evil Angel. Her porn is some of the nastiest fucking porn at Evil Angel. You know what I mean? And she like set the bar in a lot of ways and was like the Vanguard director while she was there. Um, and she you know, she may be a non-binary. I've never spoken to her about it, but she's very, very feminine and very, very female. And like the idea that your gender um, should cast aspersion on your ability is that's just misogyny. But yeah. we, as Southern Californians, we, our culture is like misogyny and cocaine. It's like what we export to the world. Right. And it's just like something that we've hung on to for a really long time because we've never known anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and we, as women, maybe we didn't have the chance to say anything else and maybe it was just easier or more convenient for us to kind of like get in line. Um, but that's not the way the world is anymore. And that's not the way um, sex culture is responding. Like as part of the digital revolution, it's just not how it is, which is, I think great. I agree with you. I think there should be more female directors of companies. And I think if you're, if you're a man and you have had sex with talent and, and there are, consequences like I think that you should be a man and accept those consequences and that's okay because people do bad things and people abuse power all the time and it's okay to say I did these things and I made these decisions and they were wrong and I see that and I am going to change the way that I act mm -hmm. um you know and if that means that you don't work there anymore that means you don't work there anymore yeah well I mean only recently has the power of the performer comes such in such a way and also the power of social media that because these things have been happening forever with a lot of these directors and only recently have they really been pushed out of their positions because performers weren't afraid to come forward because they no longer financially depended on these companies 
to pay their rent, to pay their bills. They could make money on their own. And so they didn't have to be so afraid of being blacklisted. They could say, I had a bad experience with this person and this is not okay. And then all these other girls who also had a bad experience could chime in and say, I also had a bad experience. This is not okay. So it's been an, it's been a crazy year. It has been a crazy year for myself. Um, I, when, when I wasn't directing at all, when I was just working on my own, uh, product and mainly performing, I am a notorious director fucker. I have gotten in so much trouble with Spiegler where he was like, stop fucking directors and stop fucking producers. And I was like, yeah, but for me, it's like fun and also an easy way to manipulate them. Mm. Like what, what am I supposed to do? Like that, this is the power that is granted to me by the patriarchy. And I accept this. Like, this is my value and this is my point of control. And I accept this. Like, who are you to tell me that my participation in the system that I didn't, you know, design, um, engenders like badness for myself. So that, that for me, and then I spoke to John Staliano about this and he, like, he, 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 in this form and this conversation we had on this particular day did not think that that was effective overall. And I agreed with him. I think that you should be hired for a job and it should be a more professional environment. There should be less coercion or le- less, less um, of, a, of a less engendering the environment of capitalistic coercion via like, you know, fucking each other to get things out of each other than there, than there has been in porn. Um, I have not had an environment where I was on a set and somebody touched me or did something that I didn't like, where I didn't stand up and was like, fuck you, fuck everybody in this fucking room, fuck your mother, like, and then called Spiegler. But that's also because I'm a Spiegler girl. And that is like a point of privilege in Southern California pornography because bad shit is not going to happen to me in that way. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that perhaps it might also be the fact that like you are a strong woman, you have an aura of strength that is evident to anybody who's ever met you. And I think that people look at you and they're like, I'm not going to fuck with her. Correct. You are absolutely correct because I'm friends with so many fucking people who have had indiscretions and scandals and they had, they didn't touch me or do anything. Like I'm, I'm not the girl that you rape at the party. And that's exactly like, that is exactly it. In fact, um, I'm not going to name names cause it's like embarrassing and humiliating, but there were directors 10 years ago who were like, Hey, I want to fuck you super bad. And I totally went home with them and pulled out my strap on and was like, here it is. <laughs> and how do they react? Uh, one guy said it was fine. And another guy was like, Oh fuck. But I'm like, that is like what? And that's the reputation that I have also. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, not to take me home because I'm going to try to fuck your asshole. And like, most guys don't want that kind of thing. Or most guys that direct in porn don't want that kind of thing. Um, so you're right. I am not the person that's just going to become a problem for. And so that being said, it's and, and John Saliano on the day that he did say that to me is right. That that is not a good environment to be the pervasive environment. Like we should take that out of the equation. There shouldn't be like mixing. Um, a lot of companies, uh, mainstream companies as well are, um, implementing, um, uh, rules where you can't have inter like office affairs. And that, I think that it's a, it's a good boundary for people to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, it can get, it can get murky and it can get very confusing. And, you know, perhaps for somebody like you, who's, very good at establishing boundaries, who is a powerful woman on her own. And I doubt anybody has ever, you know, been very successful at taking advantage of you. Uh, There's a lot of girls who don't know how to manage that situation, you know, and they feel pressured to do things that they don't want to do because setting boundaries is difficult. You know, it is a hard thing to do. It is something that I'm still working on. Setting boundaries is so difficult. I am super good at setting boundaries when it comes to work, but my personal life, I have trouble setting boundaries. So I think it's kind of like, it's a balancing act, but you're, and, and women shouldn't have to make these fucking rules. Like women shouldn't have to be the ones who directly address the patriarchy when they get to work. These boundaries should be set for them before they get there. Yeah. So I I agree. agree. Okay. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. 
because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, everybody, we're back. So Aiden, I want to talk a little bit about the question I pretty much ask everybody just because everybody's story is so unique and I think so interesting. How did you get into the adult industry? And then how did you, I assume you started as a performer and then moved to directing. How did that transition happen? That is not what happened. Okay. So I'm wrong. Yeah. Most people assume that because I am female body that I was a performer and then I got to directing and, um, I am from New York which is completely outside of the very specific way that Southern California does porn, which is very regimented. Um, I started working as a phone girl in a dungeon in New York city. Um, and I was 19 years old. I was going to NYU at the time. And I also had a job at another academic institution that has a hospital and has a school in New York. Um, that I don't want to name what it is because my aunt also works there. Um, but I was working in medical research because I'm a giant nerd. I, this is like all like curlers and fucking paint and just like positioning them properly. Cause I'm a giant fucking nerd. And, um, because I'm a giant nerd, it was easier for me to get into the business aspect and the managing aspect of, uh, working in the sex industry. And so I worked as a phone girl and I managed the dungeon And, um, I also, um, they were transferring from, um, magazines to, um, digital media. So I helped them like scan chromes, which is something that I did at my, um, hospital job as well. Um, because we didn't have digital cameras yet. We still used, um, uh, the Chrome cameras. And so I worked on that with them and I helped them with their website in the nineties during fucking dial up porn. I and, remember those days. <laughs> yeah. And we worked and I worked, I helped them with advertising and I helped them with their business model. And I helped women um, express themselves in, um, a, you know, in that like sex worker environment. Um, I also, and I don't know if this is common knowledge. A lot of people know I am more interested in women than I am in men sexually by like a 90, 10 percentile, which because I'm an NB. Um, and I sometimes have sex with men doesn't make me a lesbian, but that's like the closest word for what's going on here. So being a manager in, uh, an environment where it was a bunch of like women sexually expressing themselves for money was like fucking utopia for me. I loved it. I loved my fucking dungeon job. I loved working there. I, I did eventually become a performer there. Um, I started doing a couple of movies with women that I was already having sex with. Um, which seems so natural to me to express yourself on camera. I was already interested in film. Um, I went to NYU for arts and science, but for I wanted to be a doctor, which sounds so dumb now that I say it, but I did. Um, but I thought about going to Tisch, which is their film school, and I had all my stupid fucking student film um, package, you know, like my um, uh, um, application together, but I went for arts and science instead. And I was interested in film and like expressing yourself in BDSM movies with women that I was already experiencing BDSM with seems so natural to me. So I started doing that. 
but really I was an administrator and I was a manager and I managed the company and I ran their website and I directed the scenes. And what we did was we shot scenes for girls based on the kind of sessions that they wanted to come in. So if you were like a boot dominatrix and you really went to a bunch of guys to worship your boots, I was like, okay, so this whole fucking shoot about boots. We did a rag mag, um, which is like those big, like, like um, only a couple of color magazines. And I worked in Adobe and Cork Express and made those magazines with the publishing company, Star Publishing Company, I think it was a really long time ago. That was like in the building with us. So I did that and I helped women get clients by um, like organizing these shoots for them. And then we did like nerdy fucking, like we did parties that were like heaven and hell. And so there were like these like, like mythologically themed photo shoots that were just like fun to do and artistic. And we had the money because it's sex work. And so we had the money to do these and it was just part of the advertising budget. So I worked in administration before I was ever a performer. I disagreed with one of the other head managers and I was really young at the time. And I wanted to quit being administrator because I was like, fuck this. I can go off and do my own shit. And so I bought more latex and dyed my hair and like lined my shit up and had got a makeup artist because I didn't learn how to do makeup growing up because my mom is like a extreme feminist who thinks that makeup is like a trapping of the patriarchy. So I didn't know how to do it before I became a sex worker um, and got a makeup artist and decided to go and become a performer um, in my early twenties. And then um, 9-11 happened and the bottom fell out of New York and I moved to California with a bunch of other um, sex workers and the story kind of continues from there. And then I had my own site first. I ran a dungeon in Los Angeles and it had, I had my own site and I um, edited the porn myself in my office. Um, and I pressed the DVDs myself and I used to make these DVDs that were like so dirty that you had to pay cash for them and they were private collection only. And that's how, of course I met the people from evil angel, <laughs> um, because there are the supreme perverts, you know, and they'll admit it. Um, that's how I met Joyce Silvera. That's how I met David Aaron Clark, who was my best friend for years before he passed away. That's how I started working in mainstream porn, um, doing um, wardrobe first for them because David was shooting in my dungeon and renting my location. And I said, well, you're not going to have the girl wear that, are you? Because it was some terrible, like, feather boa, fucking horrible early aughts porn shit. And I was like, she looks like she's my size. Why don't you just let me put her in my latex? Because, like, you're shooting in my studio. Like, it just... It, it doesn't go, you know? Um, mm. So I, I started working with him on those projects and I worked on his crew for a really long time. And then I worked for Eli Cross on his crew for a really long time. Um, and then I started doing more porn. I did some light girl, girl fetish porn while I was doing mostly professional domination in the early aughts, but it was because it was easy access to having sex with women, um, which is my main motivation for being a performer. And um, it just upped like my value for being um, an in-person um, sex worker, which at my core, I guess, is who I am. I am a performer director, but at my core, I'm a provider, mm -hmm. which we don't talk about that much because it's still criminalized in the United States. So you don't get like the free information about being a provider. And I think in porn culture, it's also at least it used to be kind of looked down on. Yeah, that is absolutely true. So for those who may not understand what you mean by provider, we're talking about escorting, right? I would we're talking about which is a form of dom that, yes. a form of that. Yeah. I have um I've had a couple of of escorts on my show and and I always really appreciate when people are speaking openly about that. And it's so interesting how that job is about so much more than just sex. Yes. You know, it's about fulfilling somebody's needs on a physical and an emotional level. Yes. It's somatic and psychological simultaneously. It's so deep. So how did you transition to directing for Evil Angel? How did that opportunity come about? Um, so I was working on a website with my friend Wolf Hudson, um, like self-shot, self-made porn. Um, and it was going okay. We weren't making like as much money as I wanted to, but it was like in kind of a bad time for that. It was like aughts, like around when the um, economy crashed. Not everybody was, nobody was really making money. And I was with Spiegler and I, um, a couple of people got sick at kink and they were like, well, you kind of just direct your own 
scenes anyway, or I'm like, I'll take direction from someone and then I'll spin it in my own way because I have a lot of experience with BDSM because I was trained to do it from, you know, being like in my late teens, like being 19. Um, and so often I had more experience than the people who were directing the porn who were, you know, directors. I was the dominatrix role. And so it was kind of natural for there to be a back and forth. And then they started leaving me on set to just, they're like, oh, just direct it yourself and deal with it yourself. Cause I also had my own website and made my own domination porn myself for a long time. Um, and I shot camera also for my own stuff. So I know like when you're a performer and you shoot camera, it helps so much because it makes you so much more camera aware. And also like you feel for the other person, like shooting camera hurts. If no one's ever done it, it's very painful. Mm. Like it's, high, it's the most uncomfortable thing you can do. So yeah that kind of empathy like helped me to get in with them. And I started directing for them. Um, I never signed a contract for them, but like that body of work was out there. So between that body of work and between um, uh, the Wolf Hudson stuff and my own older website, which Joey Silvera and David Aaron Clark and other people who worked at um, Evil Angel had made John Stalliano aware of. um, One day we were in the Vivid building and I was working on one of my serious XM shows that I've had on the Vivid channel for years And John was one of the guests and he looked at me and he said, um, I want you to come and make movies for us. And I was like, I'm sorry, what did you say? Like what? And he said, he looked at Christian Mann, who was the general manager at the time. And he's like, Aiden's going to turn in a movie for us. She's going to turn in a movie. And I was like, I don't. And I fought with Christian Mann about it. I was like, I'm not a mainstream pornographer. I don't fit with you fucking people. Like, I don't even know what you want. This is like all this like butthole porn for the male gaze. Like I do this really complex psychological shit over at Kink. I haven't signed a contract with them. At the time I was considering leaving Los Angeles and moving to Chicago to be a dominatrix because the economy was like kind of, again, like this is many years ago that I've Mm. been working at Evil Angel. The economy was okay, but I was like, I just don't know. Um, and, and there were a bunch of moratoriums at the time, coincidentally. And I was like, maybe I have fucking slung the D for long enough. And one of my friends that lived in Chicago that I went and I sessioned in her dungeon a lot, um, had a space open for like a senior partner, like one of the owners. And she's like, come move here, like get a fucking condo on the lake and we're going to live in Chicago and we're going to just fucking drink champagne and piss on dudes. (laughs) And it's going to be fucking awesome. And I was like, that sounds fucking awesome <laughs> i want to put that on a shirt <laughs> yeah. in chicago we're gonna drink champagne and piss on dudes. on dudes amazing um i mean mostly i do that in new york where i'm from because that's like my og place where i like to go to drink champagne and piss on dudes but i do it everywhere <laughs> so john christian said just fucking think about it nobody says no to john He's like, people work their whole fucking careers as directors and pornographers to get where he wants to put you. Don't fucking say no because you think it would be easier to go and fucking piss on dudes and fucking drink champagne. Like, just think about, think about it. And I did think about it and I thought about it for a long time. And then I turned in a movie. Oh, I signed for Jules Jordan at AVN because he had the kink distribution at the time one last time. And John evil was across from Jules this year. And John looked at me and he's like, jokingly, cause John's hilarious. I don't know if you know him, but he's like a fucking, like he is, he's a jokester. He looked at me and he's like, you're a fucking traitor. You're a fucking traitor you're with Jules Jordan. You're a fucking traitor. And I was like, listen, like this is the last time that I ever get to work anywhere else because evil angel is an exclusive contract for anyone watching the show who doesn't know. Um, Evil Angel is an exclusive contract. They kind of own you. They own your directing brand. Um, it is against the rules to direct with your name for another company. And oh, so wow. everything that I've done for Kink since I signed that Evil Angel contract has been with an alternate director name. And I've been mostly production manager, um, director, but not in name, director just in practice. Um, and so... Um, yeah, I started to work for Evil Angel. Angel John and Christian and I had the like logistical conversation in the parking lot of the vivid building, which I looked at Christian and I was like, is this what it looks like? Like when it comes for you, like what all these people have wanted is that's like in a one owner's parking lot with another owner. And he's like, yeah, this is it. It's a parking lot. Parking lot deal. (laughs) I mean, it sounds, it's just, it's, it just, 
it just illustrates the point that porn is awesome and it's super flashy and it's fucking amazing. But in the end, it's like a, it's a parking lot. <laughs> Making deals in the parking lot. Making deals in the parking lot. So that's how I ended up working there. And then, I mean, I, I think I struggled for the first couple of years, but everybody does that works at evil struggles like real hard. It's like, what are some of the struggles? Oh my God. It's so competitive. Like your base that you like, like the amount of money that they put you against in the distribution they level of they put you against is somebody like Mike Adriano where they're like, well, Mike does this many scenes and then they make this much money and here's how much money. And you're like, how much money? And you're like, there's no way I could like, I, I don't even know how I would begin to like, how do you make that much money fucking making porn? Like, what do you guys eat? Like, is there a fucking like a cauldron and you're fucking like making sacrifices in the back room? Like what's going on? But every director is like that when they first start there, because you start, you start with what you know, and then you have to move towards this like central brand and you have to line up so much. And John is tough. He is, he, I have cried. He's pulled my product apart. And I, it, and it, the thing about the evil angel contract is that almost all of it, in, in most cases, you pay for the porn yourself. Mm. And it's not a it's not a production house. It's a distribution house. Right. Really that makes cohesive. sense. The brand is really cohesive. So I made porn and it didn't do as well. And then they cut some of my lines and there were fucking fights and arguments. And then I made porn and it did better. And then I realized that I was lying trying to make like binary boy girl porn because like, that's not me. Like I'm not, I don't like get on my back and spread my butthole so that dudes can put their penises in it. Like it's just, I've never done that and I'm never going to. So what went well for me, I was working with trans women because, um, you know, I made some trans porn and then I got connected to Aubrey, Kate and we were both like established at the time, but our careers, like the, the magic that we had together was like something like I, I just connected with her in this way that she was like my ultimate muse and the stuff that we were able to put out together just hit people so hard. And it resonated with so many people. And she like, she lives in super fucking infamy now. You know what I mean? And like, I do. Okay. Like people know my shit and like my porn wins awards and I make money and like I've established my brand for myself. But until I decided to really like make what I was passionate about, despite that people were like, well, you shouldn't make porn. You should make trans porn. You shouldn't make like pansexual or alternative sexuality porn because like the boy girl is the way it is. And most people are straight and that's what they want to see. And I kept like telling myself like, like, Oh, like, uh, I'll just make like rough girl, girl porn and it'll be straight enough where people like it until I like did what I was supposed to do there. You know, it didn't, it, it was hard. It was so working there kind of made you find yourself and find your path. And it, so you're saying that it wasn't until you started creating porn that personally, I don't know if I'm saying personally spoke to you is the right way, but that, that was something that was personal to you and that you enjoyed and you weren't trying to make somebody else's product. That's when you found success. Yeah. It was hard. It was hard to, to realize that and admit that. And like, it's such a hurdle to overcome like the idea of like what we're supposed to make. And it's like being a performer where people like critique the performer and they're like, well, you should change your hair color. You should do this. You should do that. Like you're too fat. You're too skinny. You should get a boob job, get a nose job. Don't like it's, it's never really going to stick or gel until you make like what it is that you're meant to make. And that is at the core of like whatever you are on the inside. I think well, that is, that's really insightful. I have found that I think my biggest problem is that I tend to bounce around to a lot of different things because I like, I really ultimately enjoy shooting solo girl. That's kind of always been, my favorite thing. And I think I've shot boy girl and I've shot girl girl and I don't mind shooting either in them at all. And sometimes sure, it's really sure. enjoyable, but I think ultimately a lot of times I would shoot that stuff because that's what sells. Yeah. When really I think where my talent lies is doing, you know, more stuff like for playboy and doing like yeah. 
retreat solo stuff like that's, but I've, I've always struggled with that because I'm like, that's not what sells, what sells is boy girl. And so I never really focus my attention on curating any one thing. I'm just like, I'll try that. I even had a fetish site for a while. I fucking, you know, I've been in like light BDSM relationship and, you know, I love latex. I love the way it looks. I love shooting latex, but yeah. I am definitely like not a part of the BDSM community. Right. So, you know, I remember I was shooting, I would shoot stuff for Taboo Magazine. I don't oh, know if yeah. you know, if you know Cynthia Patterson. Of course. Who was running it and she would yell at me all the time because like I was always doing things wrong. <laughs> I would turn in a set that was like a dominatrix, but she was wearing like a sub collar with the ring. Cause yeah. I was like, that looks fetishy. And she'd be like, no. Tom's don't wear sub collars. I was like, I don't know. So like, I mean, she was pissed. She would get pissed. Cynthia also is like an incredibly intense person. Yes. Yes. I worked is. for her before and she is incredibly intense. I love her. And I like, I like that kind of drive. I also like women who aren't afraid to be intense, but it was like a lot. Yeah. I've never been on set with her, but I've heard stories for sure. So what, I, attract, what attracted you to BDSM in the first place? I am not wired for sex like other people are. Okay. I, um, personally have to have sadomasochism number one because my first interest before ds so okay let me break this down here yeah before, please break it down before dom sub mm -hmm. i knew about sadomasochism which are not the same thing nor are they remotely or mutually exclusive i will you can be into pain exchange and sensation play and no one can be in charge or not in charge okay so for example um when I was much younger um, and I was experimenting with sex, I didn't experiment with um, penis vagina stuff. I experimented um, with pain stuff and sexualizing pain stuff. Um, I had a scar on my arm that I'm planning on covering with a tattoo just for social reasons, but that was not self-inflicted. That was um, inflicted by my partner and this was consensual. Um, this person also has lots of scarring on them from sexual encounters that we had together. Um, I was interested in um, blood play and ingestion of blood from um, formative age before I was a sex worker, um, much more so than I was interested in giving blowjobs, eating pussy, or um, um, getting fucked. It's just, I'm wired differently. I am a different kind of human being. Um, to that end, I did a lot of research about BDSM because it's a technical thing. Um, and I was self-educated for a while. I was trained in the dungeon that I worked at. I participated in the training of other dominas in that dungeon. And then when I went to work at Kink, um, Peter paid a Shibari master to come down and teach a bunch of people, but for me to finish my certification for Shibari, because if you don't know how to tie people up, you can really fucking hurt them. I also was a bondage model for years, which gives, gives you a really good idea of what it's like to be in those circumstances. So I've been a versatile, but really only for purposes of research. Like I may top, mm -hmm. um, I got into regular fetish really late. I didn't get into foot fetish until like my twenties, like my mid to late twenties, because I wasn't interested in feet before that. I was interested in like the more severe side of BDSM, which usually people get into later. I'm just wired differently. It's a natural thing. Um, I have a psychologist who's evaluated me. I'm not a dangerous sadist. I possess, possess no psych, um, sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies. I asked because I was concerned. I was like, mm -hmm. am I bad? Because mm -hmm. I like to cut people. And he's like, well, like in what, what's the context that you're cutting people? And it's always consensual. In fact, if you don't like it, I'm super fucking turned off super turned off even a girl on set if the girl's not into it i'm like everybody back the fuck up like we're just gonna get we're gonna do like first of all do what the girl likes because that's gonna be a better scene but like we're going to just like really like i have ramon when i work for kink and i do the gangbang websites or did the gangbang websites ramon was like a heavy hitter of mine because he's fucking amazing and i would tell him like today the girl is more experienced or today light just Let's just enjoy each other, have a good time, get the DP in and some bondage and 
I'll cut, we, I'll get shots to make it look really like intense so the viewers can enjoy themselves. But the girl is light and mm-hmm. we're going light today because she's not into that heavy shit and we're just going to do what she likes. If somebody doesn't like it, I can't do it. It's like a thing for me. It turns me off. So according to my psychologist, um, my sadism is, um, you know, like not dangerous, but I am a sadist. I do like to say own your nature or your nature will own you. And I spend quite a lot of time pursuing my interest in BDSM. I'm not just a professional BDSM person. I'm also a lifestyle BDSM person. Mm. I think one thing, and we've reiterated on the show so many times that a lot of people who are unfamiliar with BDSM don't understand is the integral part that consent plays in that. Yeah. And that as intense as it may appear and as it may appear to the untrained, uneducated eye that these women are being victimized in some way, there is, you know, obviously if you're working with a reputable studio like Kink, yes. um, it is absolute, consent is everything. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing that you can have this safe space to play out these tendencies with other people who truly enjoy being on the receiving end of it. Yeah. It's BDSM for me as like 100% shadow work. Like it's looking at the dark side of your personality and it's not about like controlling the other person or even like the position of like the juxtaposition of you and the other person being top or bottom. It's like looking at the dark parts of yourself and saying like, okay, I recognize this darkness inside of myself. How am I going to express myself in a way that is, you know, so like acceptable socially and consent is a huge portion of that, a huge Mm. portion of it. And it's looking and saying like, I am dark and I have these dark tendencies. How, what's the best way for me to handle that Mm -hmm. rather than trying to repress it, demonize it, or like not controlling it or not learning about it and just letting it get all over everybody. Cause a lot of people who get into BDSM are like dominatrices should be mean. There should be no um, consent boundaries. Like, it's fuck the patriarchy. Like they use it for all of these other external things that really are not the core of like how you express yourself in BDSM. It's about um, like self-awareness and it's about self-exploration for the top and for the bottom. And like it, it's, it's controlled and impacted by that societal norm of respecting other people's boundaries, because if we didn't respect each other, society would fucking fall apart. I mean, worse than it already is. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good aside note. (laughs) Yeah. There's something so intellectually fascinating about BDSM. And like I said, I was in a a very light BDSM relationship for like about a year, Mm -hmm. a long time ago. And for me, it was definitely about the intellectual like mind play than anything else. You know, it was so much more interesting. It was so much more cerebral as an experience. So yeah. the BS portion is very cerebral, but then some of the fetishes and, and SM sadomasochism, so DS dom sub uh, SM sadomasochism can just purely be somatic and physical. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where more where I've come from, like less about the control and more about the sensation and how interesting that can be. Yeah. See, for me, I found that it was the opposite for me. It was more about the control and less about the sensation because I, I remember my boyfriend actually, and he was very like uh, well-trained is not the right word, but he was very experienced. And, um, you know, he was actually the first person who introduced me to consent lists, Mm -hmm. um, which I had never heard of before in my life. He was a huge fan of insects. That was like his favorite website. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he had a consent list and I was like, what the fuck is this thing? And he was like, these are all the things that we can do. And, and and th- and not do and how do you feel about them and I was like this is so biz-. like I wasn't used to that level of communication it was so strange to me but I remember he caned me and and I did not like that at all at all <laughs> that was not fun for me but the whole we used to also do this thing where he would literally like I think one of the most erotic experiences we had was he tied me up to the ceiling and then just had me hang there while he just sat back and smoked a cigarette and like just looked at me mm-hmm. for this long, just at, to utter silence. And that was like, that was an experience and that, that kind of thing I enjoyed. So, so I've never really actually thought about differentiating between the two, but you're, you're right. For me, it was more about control and less about sensation. So it's that a distinction mixture. is interesting. It's a, it is interesting and it's a mixture. And I think that 
not only can people evolve over time in terms of where their interests lie, but like just day to day, like some days, some things are good for you and some days, some things are bad for you. Mm-hmm. Um, BDSM, BDSM culture, uh, parts of BDSM culture are very consent based and parts are not. Obviously I fuck with the ones that are consent based and it does definitely spill over into vanilla style sex, which is nice because, because BDSM companies like Kank and um, I've never worked for insects, but I believe that they probably had similar protocol because they're like sister brother companies. Um, Kink has a big checklist and that's kind of um, bled into or onto mainstream porn because mainstream porn people are exposed to kink sets and they're like, oh, you can have this kind of checklist for any kind of porn that you do. And you can have conversations about any kind of sex act. And it doesn't just have to be BDSM. It can be anything. Um, there are also like, gray areas of um control that we play with in uh mainstream or vanilla pornography for example the girl's always the one getting fucked if a guy's getting fucked it's called pegging and that is niche so we definitely have like you know that like it definitely is like of the patriarchy and for the male gaze like the scene ends with the dude ejaculating more often than not sometimes no but more often than not that's that's the signal Um, because that's the goal. And like these things, they are control structures. We just don't call them control structures because we live and breathe and eat and shit them every single day. And so we don't think that that's a control structure, but it is. So that leads me to my next question for you. And that is about pegging, which you've mentioned a couple of times. And I, you know, very much have always thought of that as niche. It's not not saying that I've ever been interested in engaging in. I'm a natural submissive, so I, I never really want to dominate anybody. And I always thought that it was something that was kind of, you know, I'll admit to my own biases was um, emasculating. And it wasn't actually honestly until I had Michael Vegas on who explained to me his love of pegging that opened me up to this whole new way of thinking about it. Yeah. So can you explain to me, because you've mentioned pegging a few times and, and, and how much you enjoy wearing a strap on, what is it about that sex act that you enjoy? And is it, can it only be done in a dominating way or are there other ways to engage in that? That's so different. That's a fantastic question. And pegging is separate from just wearing a strap on because pegging implies that there's a man and a woman and the woman is fucking the man with a strap on. And most of my experience wearing a penis has been fucking women. Mm. And when I do that, it's just like a guy fucking a girl. Except yeah, there's, there's no like, it's still like just a girl, girl sex. It's not its own niche. Like pegging is you're right. It's just like, and in my sex with a strap on controlling, I'm not, I don't have to choke the other woman or hold the other woman down. I mean, I like to, but that's, it's not necessary for me to enjoy myself. Um, I just like having a penis. Um, uh, with pegging, it can be the same thing where it's just you having sex and having a penis, having boobs and having a female face, but just also having a penis and expressing yourself as a non-binary, as like some, someone that has, it's like the vessel and the vector. Instead of the vessel, you're the vector. And it can just be those things, like very simple and straightforward. Um, Michael, I've obviously done it with Michael before. And he likes his uh, the women that he plays with to kind of service tap him. Um, like just to, to do prostate play and extreme like toys um, and pegging. Um, I don't remember being particularly mean to Michael. Um, when we so when you say when you say service topping, you mean it's not necessarily a woman dominating him. It's like they're they're fucking his ass, but it's not like they're fucking his ass in an emasculating way. It's not emasculating unless that is what is called for. So service topping is a trade term, BDSM trade term, where the top is doing the bottom is saying. Do, please do this to me. Then please do that to me. Then please do this to me. Then please do that to me. Then please do this to me. Then please do that to me. Um, so there's fucking, if there's any control, it's coming from the bottom. Mm-hmm. That's service topping. And so it's very preferential towards the bottom. Um, mm-hmm. He might like DS uh, pegging. I don't remember. I think that we just did 
like regular kind of sex pegging. I don't remember. It was a really long time ago, but that can happen where you're not necessarily mean to the guy and it's not emasculating and it's not about sex as a form of control. It's just sex as a form of like vector and vessel, like just a different set of genitalia. Mm -hmm. And evil angel is like known for that. I mean, there's not so much now, but like, for sure, for a while, Joey Silvera's um, Strap Attack series was like what people thought about when they thought Evil Angel. And they are considered mainstream porn. That is not, it is like there's a lot of niche based content there, but they are a mainstream porn company. So believe it or not, these um, necessarily like gender roles can switch in more of a mainstream context. And we're seeing that as the idea of what mainstream porn is um, in terms of distribution platforms breaks down. We are seeing that as Pornhub rises, as OnlyFans rises, we are seeing a change in what is considered to be mainstream or like the binary expression of sexuality. Um, The rise in trans women is a great example because that's not the same thing as pegging um, because in pegging there's a woman who puts on an apparatus and fucks a man in the ass. Um, Trans is, um, you know, people who are in in between trans uh, or transgender uh, transitioning genders. Um, but sometimes you will find yourself in a trans porn with a woman who has a penis and doesn't want to, um, erase the fact that she has a penis who doesn't want to lean towards having bottom surgery. Doesn't want to necessarily be the bottom, but feels like a woman who is a top with a penis. You Mm -hmm. do find that it's not particularly common. Um, but I have found that and, um, that woman, um, can fuck people in their holes and that can play on evil angel and people can watch that right after they watch an Adriano scene. And yeah. like the, these ideas of non-binary or, or gender expression that um, like express themselves in different ways in terms of like what you have going on in your pants are becoming more and more uh, mainstream than they have been in the past. Yeah. I, I definitely am seeing that happen within our own industry but you know youtube is such a such a mainstream avenue that so many of the comments i get on his interview is just men in absolute disbelief that anybody could consider pegging anything but gay you know and it How just makes me realize and gay like that doesn't even make any sense it's because because the idea of a man being penetrated what? to so many men is is gay and it just And again, like being confronted with my own biases that I had before I I sat down and talked to Michael, I really do believe that was one of the most eye opening interviews that I've had, which is why I love this show so much because it has just like opened my eyes to so many different things and expanded, expanded my mind. And just, you know, it's just been such a wonderful learning experience. Uh, But I, I see things so differently now. So, I mean, we have a long way to go, but we're definitely seeing that transition happen. And, and also too, there's been comments from people from men who've been like, I'm so happy that this is here. I enjoy anal play, but I was always afraid of like how I would be seen. And, and now I feel like it could be more accepted and, and I don't have to feel ashamed about this or be worried that like I'm labeled gay, which is, you know, its own, you know, labeling things as gay is its own problem in itself that, you know, I mean, the, 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 the bottom line and the truth of the situation is that men have a prostate and they have nerves around the ring of their anus and they're capable of not only like, but the anal orgasm in the same fashion that women are, um, they're capable of prostate orgasm. Um, and why would you as a man want to deny yourself this pleasure that you could be yeah. having? Like life is short. We're all going to die of a super virus. Like, <laughs> Why would you deny yourself this pleasure? And I think that more men are coming around to the idea that like, it's not emasculating to want pleasure in your asshole. Like it doesn't like being fucked in the ass can be an act of, of love and affection. And it doesn't have to be DS and doesn't have to be a dominatrix doing it to you. It can just be because it feels good and you're enjoying your body with your partner, which is a lot of what pegging is. And, and the Joey Silvera kind of pegging, especially like his stuff is very soft domination. Um, a lot of the times it's not where it's just a girl fucking a guy cause the guy likes it. And then the guy fucks the girl and they're versatile. And there's that whole exchange that happens. I think that he really, as a director and evil angel as a company really made huge strides in showing like that you can be versatile and there doesn't have to be DS when it comes to men receiving anal pleasure from women. Mm. 
All right. So I have one last question that I just want to wrap up with, because I know that this is something that if I don't ask you, a lot of people are going to wonder why I didn't ask you. So uh, about a month ago or something, you mentioned that you were no longer doing production managing for Kink Mm -hmm. or directing for Evil Angel. But as we spoke previously before we started this podcast, it sounds like that statement was kind of twisted in a way in which it was not intended. So could you maybe explain that? Sure. It definitely was twisted in a way that it wasn't intended. Um, people said all sorts of shit to me on Twitter and texted me all sorts of things that weren't remotely what I said. Avian and Expos also put out press releases that I didn't understand why anyone put up press release that I just wrote something on Twitter so that people knew what was going on with me. Cause a lot of people asked me for jobs and um, the bottom line is that I wouldn't be able to offer them employment at those companies anymore because I chose to take a step back from all of mainstream pornography because I think that, the machine stopped and a lot of, uh, and mainstream pornography has a lot of fucking issues. Um, being part of mainstream pornography, I perpetuate the machine and I put my hand on the wheel and I, you know, I turn the portion of the machine that I'm responsible for. And that turns the other portions of the machine. And I don't like some of those other portions of the machine and they don't resonate with me as a human being. And I don't feel like I am purporting an authentic experience by turning my portion of the mainstream porn machine, I wanted to get off the machine and just take a fucking look at it and just say like, what are we doing? How do we treat each other? Um, What are the implications of how I make my money and who does that money go to? How do they act? What kind of accountability do they have for their part in what's going on? And what does that mean about my accountability? Mm -hmm. Um, And that tweet was about accountability. like it said, I am complicit and I apologize. People leave that part out. Um, all I can do is look at what I do. I can't call companies and say, I don't like your fucking practices and I don't like what you do and you need to change this and you change that. And that's fine if people want to do that. I'm just saying for me, personal accountability is more important. And looking at if if I say like, well, you come to my set and it's an ethical set and I make ethical porn, like, is that even possible? Can you even make ethical porn if you don't control the way everyone else is acting? You only control the way you're acting on your sets. And a lot of why I stayed being a director was because the porn that I experienced as a performer was not ethical and it was shitty and people were weird and talked to me in ways that I, that wasn't appropriate and um, didn't, wasn't, weren't trying to get the job done. They were just trying to control and be nasty. And I went to work every day and I was like, well, my sets are going to be better. And my performers were like, Oh, we love working for you. Cause a lot of sets there and it's nice to us. I work in a, in a, an industry where people are not nice to each other. I don't know how I feel about that. Mm. I think that I have ideas of how porn should be shot and how it should be marketed and how it like, and how it should be consumed by people and what that means. And I make porn and the porn that I make isn't made inside of a vacuum. It goes out into the universe. And so I'm responsible for like how performers feel. Um, marketing materials that are associated with pornography and the fact that they, and, and the way other companies act and the accountability that other companies have over their um, employees. And I am in bed with all these people. And I, I just wanted to get up from the table and push back. And I, I can only push back from the two companies that I have contracts with. I can't push back from browsers because I, I don't work there. You know, like I pushed back from evil angel and I pushed back from kink because I was pushing back from all of mainstream porn. But In my defense, everybody pushed back from mainstream porn because it was fucking COVID. And Kink isn't accepting. No one directs at Kink right now. No one's a production manager at Kink right now. Like it's all these like small, it's in-house and they're buying small product that's made by um, people in quarantine pods. Like it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people stopped doing their jobs in the same way that I did. I was just the one who said it to those two companies and the one who said it on Twitter. So people are looking at me, but- you know, other evil angel directors haven't directed anything since February either. Right. Right. Yeah. My geeks the same. We, we're not, we're not back in yeah. production. It's not like I quit this job that everybody else simultaneously quit, but because I said it on Twitter, it was like this fucking scandal. And yeah. also why is it such a scandal that I might like want to think about my life and quit my job? Like, why is it a scandal for me to say I've been complicit in like a system that I think has its issues? I I wasn't pointing my finger at anyone, but that's what people wanted to see. Mm. They wanted to see me pointing my finger like you did these things and you perpetrated these things. There's so much blood 
and so many people's fucking hands in porn. All I was trying to do was stand up and be like, there's blood everywhere. Like I have blood all over me and I just don't want to fucking work in a slaughterhouse anymore. Like I, like it's not my intention. And I certainly wasn't saying like porn is a shit house and like we treat everybody poorly all the time, but like we make mistakes. There's definitely changes that need to be made for sure. Yeah. And I think that's never been more evident than it is right now. That's all I was saying by that tweet. But I think like people, people really, people really took it and they really ran with it. That's Twitter for you. <laughs> well, Twitter is a great decider, you know? Yeah. It's the great decider of like who gets to stay and who has to leave, which is ridiculous. It's the judge, it's the judge, the jury, and the executioner. It is. What do you think about that? What do you think about Twitter being the judge, the jury, and the executioner? Because I don't know that I like it. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I, um, I mean, believe me, I've said this so many times. It is true. Like I jump on Twitter every day, like waiting to get canceled for something. I don't know what, I mean, you know, I try to do the best I can and I've tried to like you always produce ethical porn and do the right thing, but I don't know, you know, maybe I did something wrong that I'm not aware of, or maybe I was blind to something. Um, I do also think that it's a place where people just kind of scream into the ether or within their own echo chamber, right? Because then they have all these other people that usually the people that are following them are their people that are going to automatically agree with them. So then they get kind of egged on by all these other people who really don't actually understand the situation. And nobody does research and nobody considers both sides. And it's so reactionary. It's just, um, it's terrible. I really hate it. And uh, it's funny. I think to myself about, um, I stay out of like Twitter arguments, like, for the most part, I really, really do. I do not engage, but I did get into one like little mini disagreement, um, actually with Julia Ann on Twitter over, uh, over, um, you know, people going out and like, uh, performing for their own at the very beginning of quarantine when people were really freaking out about other people working with other people. And I kind of said something along the lines of like, I didn't like this like policing that everybody was doing about everybody else's lives. And Julia Ann kind of stepped in and said some things. And, and you know what we did? We called each other on the phone and we had a conversation yeah. like adults, like, adult. and, like adults and everything was fine. You know what I mean? And so many people don't do that. They don't, you know, and I had issues with a couple of people, performers on Twitter who, who got upset with me. And I reach out to them personally because I'm not engaging on Twitter. Like I'm not, you know, where you've just got like, you know, in the, in the, in the public sphere where you've got people on both sides, like cheering for their team. It's not about like winning or losing an argument. And in both instances, I, I found, I believe that a lot of it was just like a misunderstanding and we talked about it and I think we're fine. Um, you know, but people just don't talk to each other anymore, you know, and it's so frustrating. And maybe because you and I are the same age and we come from a time when you actually had conversations with people face to face and you didn't talk to them through a faceless app with a bunch of strangers chiming in. Yeah. Um, it's just a different world. And there's been a lot of good things that Twitter has done and just social media in general, but it's also like a lot of bad. So. Yeah. It's both. Part of my tweet um, was that my my product, my films when viewed by the public do more harm than good. Mm. Um, and I wonder that about Twitter. Sometimes. Yeah. I wonder that about Twitter. Does it do more harm than good? Um, I think that it's valuable because it did definitely open the dialogue with um, female performers talking about um, – on set uh, safety violations um, because so many companies are fucking asleep at the wheel. Right. And they don't have a checks and balances. Kink has a really strong checks and balances. And a couple of times that I've been through arbitration, I opened it myself because a performer had an issue with something that I had done on set. And I was like, um, I'm uploading the raw footage right now. Like, please do a full investigation. If I've done something, like, please let me know how I can change my behavior um, because they give a fuck. You know, it's funny that people are like, oh, you fuck these companies. And I was like, Evil Angel and Kink, like, they really give a shit. 
Mm-hmm. They really, really, really fucking care about people. Neither of them are perfect. I know that both of them have had massive fucking scandals. Everybody knows that. I don't have to say that. Like you, yeah. you know, Google it. Um, they care. The people who work there are not perfect people. They really, 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 really care about performers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just owners. It's a ton of people and executives and other people that work in the companies who care about how performers are treated. They are highly ethical companies. Um, they kink has full arbitration. Like they are pr- probably one of the most strict about those things. They fire fucking directors all the time for infractions and, and moral infractions or, or performer boundary infractions. They take this shit very seriously. Um, and it's, it's still not enough to have companies like a company that does that. Like there needs to be, there needs to be accountability for everybody that works in porn. And I don't know what that looks like, Holly. And it's been, you know, I've had all these conversations with other performers and people about what we can do and how accountability works and who should be in charge of things and how things should be done. And I've, I don't see any good answer I don't see anybody that's like able to organize anything or anybody that really understands how accountability works in terms of like a streamlined, like checks and balances fashion um, or a ruling party. Um, One of the original incarnations of APAC was maybe kind of trying to go for that was one of their mission statements and that fizzled to whatever that is now, you know, I don't, know that there's necessarily like I know that they don't feel empowered to hold accountability which is something that they while they might want to good things to happen I don't know that they feel empowered to do so or they feel like they have people behind them or that we are tight enough as a as a culture and a community of porn people to agree on these things I can't walk into companies and be like I demand that you don't work with agencies um if they um, fuck their models and they don't realize that that's wrong and issue fucking shitty, fucking retractive fucking um, PR statements that just are like, fuck you if you have a vagina. I don't, I, you know, I can't go to a company and be like, oh, if there's a fucking huge company that deals with all of your fucking web traffic that has had multiple sex scandals, that call the police if you have a fucking problem. We don't care. Fuck you. I can't walk in and be like, you don't do business with them anymore. I don't even have that power. And like, I'm, I consider myself pretty powerful in like the modern porn, like cultural zeitgeist. It's like the inmates running the asylum. And I think like it does need to change. And I don't know what that looks like. Do you have any idea what that looks like? Oh, no. I mean, you know what I think it looks like? I think it looks like what's happening right now. I think it looks like us having this conversation. I think it looks like people – having the, you know, balls to to speak up about it. I think it looks like companies having very serious discussions about how they can produce more ethical content about, you know, panels being hosted by industry trade organizations such as ABN and XBiz. I think it looks like what we're trying to do right now. Whether or not that's going to solve all our problems. The more interesting portion of that I don't direct to Evil Angel anymore and that I don't production manage for Kink anymore is that I have coffee with John Stelliano every single Sunday and we talk about this shit like ad nauseum. Mm. Like all we do is talk about like what does it look like? Like what's appropriate behavior? What is what's appropriate checks and balances? What does anyone have the power to tell anyone else? Like Every single week I go and hang out with him and Joey Silvera and other people and have these conversations. Um, I'm in touch with Allison, the CEO of Kink, um, about like, and she's more formal. She's like emails and like item lists and, you know, like um, uh, she's more corporate and more formal, which of course Kink is more corporate and formal than Evil Angel. Um, and I, I have these conversations. Oh my God, so much. So yeah. much. So I guess conversation is the way is the way to push it forward. I personally feel very um I feel frustrated. I love making yeah. porn. I love like shooting gangbangs. I, I shoot oh god, I shot so many fucking gangbangs last year. I shoot a minimum of two gangbangs per month and like it's always the girl's first DP or sometimes her first anal, like often her first gangbang. Like I get these young girls who are impressionable and I feel like we all have really have a good time. And 
you know, it means something to me to be part of porn culture this way. And I don't want to not be part of porn culture. I just don't know that I can call myself like an ethical human being if there's so much blood. Mm -hmm. But it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. It's interesting too, because we are forced to be put in this position because of COVID where we're talking about it, Mm -hmm. but we don't have the opportunity to execute this new, you know, structure that we're going to follow or this new code of conduct or whatever. So like all of these discussions that we're having about how we can change porn, we're not really in a position to, to put those into play and to see if it works and who knows when that's going to happen. Right. Because when is the world going to go back to normal? Is it ever going to go back to normal? So it's yeah. a strange time. It's super strange times, but I think because COVID, we are able to have this conversation. So while we aren't able to get past it, COVID pressed the pause button on the machine, but it's holding its finger on the pause button, which is, I mean, obviously we are not able to rectify our, like, even if we had something to put forward to try, like maybe it does need to cook a little bit longer. And maybe we do need to listen to the universe and be like, well, the universe is still saying pause. Like right. It's right. Time for us all to go back to fucking each other in the asshole and. But I, I did say to one of my friends that is a performer who's much younger than me that the, I think the only way to change because porn is a capitalist structure is that companies need to decide that they don't work with people who don't have good boundaries and then performers need to decide that they don't work with agents and companies and representatives that don't have good boundaries. And if you take away the product from the system, it will erode that kind of like negative um, accountability structure that we have. All right. Well, thank you so much, Aiden, for coming on. This was amazing. You, you know, you know that I've been after you for a while. Yes. And a long time. Yes. And I finally, it's so funny because it's only in quarantine that I've been able to nail down people like you. There's been a couple of people that I've been after that are just too busy, you know, which I totally understand. So, so in a way like COVID has been good for me in terms of me finally being able to get on guests that I've, I've really wanted to have on. You're yeah. definitely one of them. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Can you tell everybody uh, where they can find you online? And also too, we never really talked about your, your Sirius XM show, but I know that you have one. So maybe tell people a little bit about that, where they can find that. Sure. Maybe even a little bit about what it's about. Like, what do you, what do you talk about on that show? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter now because it's suspended due to COVID. So, eh. um, but there are replays. Um, you can find us on the um, Sirius XM app. I don't remember what channel I'm on now because that's how long it's been since I've fucking been on the show. 415. Yeah. 415. Um, I am a serious XM host and you on my show, my show is called, um, diary of a dominatrix and it's me talking about BDSM stuff and it's me, um, engaging in BDSM things with people. So my callers can call in and we can do a real time session. Um, I really only do what I want to do, which guys don't really necessarily understand that I'm not a Coke machine. That you don't just put a quarter in me and then like what you want fucking comes out. Like you have to talk to me about what you like. And then we talk about what I like and then we see if we're compatible. And if we're compatible, we can do play. And if not, I tell you to call back on another fucking day. I'm non-versatile. So if you don't want to play with someone who just tops, I'm not for you. But if you like to get fucked in the butt or do other things like eat your cum or tell me that you're a dirty little whore or reverse gangbang stuff like that. Um, you can call in my show when it goes back on the air. Who knows when that's going to be whenever COVID is over. A lot of people want to know when those shows are coming back. Sirius has not told us, um, but it is on the vivid channel on Sirius XM and it's four one five. I'm pretty sure which is terrible that I don't have that memorized. I feel like the world's biggest fucking slacker. I've had the show for fucking forever too, for years. I also have an educational series um, xruniversity.com. Um, it's XRU. I've been doing it for about seven years. I do it with Ian Rath, who's my friend, who also works in the departmenting, uh, the marketing department at Extreme Restraints. And that is about um, BDSM and sex toys, sex toy education. Um, we talk about consent a lot. We talk about uh, BDSM culture, um, slut culture. That's really fun. Um, my solo project that I'm working on right now is on uh, OnlyFans, and it's called titsandsass.me. Um, and then I'm all over kink and I'm all over evil angel and you can see my porn, just Google 
my porn. I'm sure it'll come up. It's it'll it'll be there. It'll be there. See my boobies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you guys can catch me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. I am shadow banned, especially on Twitter. I guess it's gotten so bad that people have told me that they've tried to search for my name on Twitter and they can't find it. So actually this is really sad, but the best way to get around that, and I do this a lot with performers because a lot of performers are shadow banned. If you just put Holly Randall Twitter in Google, it comes up. that will take you to my to my um, account where you can actually uh, follow me. So if you can't like follow me within the Twitter app, do it that way. And that actually will work for almost any performer and will help you bypass all of the fake accounts as well. So just like a little trick, a little trick there. Um, obviously to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where you can get a lot of bonus content, including this Q and a that Aiden and I are going to do right after this, which is exclusive for my members you can join my Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. And if you're listening to this, go check out the video interview at youtube.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for listening. Aiden, thank you again for coming on. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.